Now let's have a look at the details of our algorithm. To do that, we want to do two steps. We want to do two traverses of our whole tree. First, we want to do a post-order traversal. And then we want to do a pre-order traversal to compute the exact x and y coordinates. So in the post-order traversal, we prepare for this computation. We want to collect a lot of information. In the first step of this phase, we want to compute the horizontal displacement of the left and the right child of every vertex. What does that mean? If we look at this vertex here, the left child goes one to the left and the right one, one to the right. So their horizontal displacement compared to the parent is here minus one and here plus one. From here to here it's plus one, here to here it's minus one, here minus one plus one, minus one plus one. So with this information, we can already compute x and y coordinates because the y coordinates we just get from the depth and if we have the y coordinate and we have the displacement, we know exactly where to place the vertices. So if we can compute this for every edge, then in the second phase, we can get our complete drawing. But of course it's not that easy, because now, what are displacements here? I mean, we could put this as minus 3 and this as plus 3, but then they are too far away. We want them to be closer. And to figure out how close exactly we want to get, we have to find more information. So what we also want to do is we want to store the left and the right contour of every subtree. Let's do this in a second drawing. The contour is just a list of vertices that form the left and the right boundary. So if we look at this tree here, we would start here and then move along this path. And now this orange list is the right boundary and this orange list here is the left boundary. The same for the green. We can start from the bottom, we go here, now we see, hey, there's another one to the right, so instead we have to take this one, and then we get the left boundary here and the right boundary here. So this contour doesn't even have to be a path in the tree, but it's just really a list of some vertices that form the boundary. If we have the right contour of the blue and the left contour of the green, then we can just walk along these contours and at every step say, okay, the distance between these two vertices has to be two, between these has to be two, and these has to be two. And with that, we can find the minimum horizontal distance between the roots. So in this case, we start at these two. We say, hey, the distance has to be at least two, so dv in the beginning is two. We continue downwards. And now we see here we go one to the left, here we go one to the left. So if these still have a distance of 2, then dv stays at 2. We continue downwards, but now we see here we go 1 to the right, here we go 1 to the left. If these two want to have a distance of at least 2, then that means that the distance between vl and vr has to be at least 4, because we came closer here. And that way we go through these two contours at the same time and we figure out what is the minimum distance we must have here so that all of these are at least two. And when we have that, then that tells us, hey, the distance here is a four. We want to place v in the middle. So the x offset is this dv divided by two in both directions. And we round up in the case it is an odd number. And then we recursively get our drawing of this subtree. Now this isn't really phrased as a divide and conquer algorithm, but basically this whole phase one is one. Why is that the case? We go post order, that means we always go from the bottom to the top. So when we go here, we want to draw this, we've already done this part, we've already done this part. So we divided it into the left and the right subtree to draw this whole subtree. Here, when we get to the vertex B, We've already done the left subtree and the right subtree. So we divide it into the left and right subtree, we drew them recursively, and in the conquer we want to combine them with V for a new drawing. That's exactly what we did here. So the only thing we have to do is we have to keep up all this information that we computed 
in the conquer step so we don't have to recompute it all the time. There's no reason for us to every time compute these minus ones and plus ones and this contour again. We already have all these numbers here. We already have the minus two and plus two. We can just store it and we have it for the future. The only thing that's left is getting a new contour of this whole drawing. And how do we get that? Well, can you figure it out? It's actually quite easy. We have the left contour of the blue, we can follow it. We have the right contour of the green and we can follow it. And the only thing that we have to change is we have to add these two edges here. And whenever we get to the end of the green contour, we might have to jump over here and continue with the blue one, if the blue subtree was longer. And the same way also in the other direction. If we get to the bottom of the left blue contour, if the green subtree is longer, we might have to continue with the green left contour. So this is the new contour we get with the subtree. And now we're done with the description of the algorithm. There are two things that remain, the running time and the correctness or the properties of this algorithm. Let's start with the running time. And the running time mainly depends on the conquer step. So what do we do here? We have to calculate the minus two and the plus two, so we have to walk along these two contours. How much time does that take? Well, we don't know really what is the depth of the tree, so it could be linear. We have to walk along this, so it could take linear time. We have order of n vertices. In every step we might take order of n time, so we have a quadratic runtime total. That's not so nice. But if we are a bit clever, we can analyze this better, and we can find that the whole thing only takes linear runtime. So how do we do this? Actually, all these contours that we walk along, we don't do that too often. So let's have a look at when do we walk along a contour. We go through the blue first. Here we have a conquer step with two subtrees, so we have to walk along this contour here, or from this vertex to this vertex. Here in the green, we have to conquer, so we have to walk along the contour here, from this to this. Here, we have to again walk along the contour, from this to this. We don't have to continue, because the right subtree doesn't continue here. And the final conquer step with two subtrees is here. Here we have to walk along the contour for a long time. But where exactly do we have to go? We have to compare these two vertices. Then we have to compare these two vertices. We have to compare these two vertices. How often can it happen that we have to compare this vertex with a vertex to the right? Exactly once. Because after this step, this vertex is not on the right contour anymore. That means for every vertex that we have in the tree, there is at most once that we have to compare its x-coordinate with the coordinate of a vertex to the right. And then it appears from the right contour. So we're done with it. So every time we compare a vertex with a vertex to the right, we remove it from the right contour. We have only n vertices, so we can only remove n vertices from the right contour because they can never re-enter it. That means there are only n steps where this can happen. There are only n steps in this whole conquer steps together where we have to compare two vertices. So the whole conquer step, it might take linear time in a single one, but if I look at all of them together, it's still linear. So we have a total linear time here. There's one thing that I skipped slightly, which is changing these contours, but that's exactly the same argument. We might have to jump from here to here, but since they are lists, even if the blue one is much, much, much longer, you just change a pointer from here to this one and you're done. You don't have to look at this again. So the time to recompute these two new contours is exactly the time as we took to compute these distances. So the whole thing runs in linear time. So let's state our result as a theorem. This algorithm actually was invented by Reingold and Tilford in 1981. And with some slight adjustments later, this is still the standard algorithm to draw trees. So let's say we have a binary tree with n vertices, we can uh, construct a drawing of it in linear time such that which properties did we have? And dot 
do we achieve? We have a planar drawing, it is straight line and it is strictly downward. So from the root to the leaves we only have downward edges. We have layered drawing, so the y coordinate of every vertex is minus its depth. The horizontal and vertical distances between our vertices are at least one. Every vertex is centered with regards to its children. The area is quadratic. That's quite easy to see. The width is at most three times the number of vertices and the height is at most the depth, which is again at the most n. But it's not optimal. So if we look at this example here, this is the drawing that we would get from this algorithm. The distance here has to be 3, because if we put it closer, then this is not as an integer coordinate. But if we change the drawing of this subtree here, and we make it a bit wider, then we can put the whole thing here much closer, because this vertex moves to the left, and now we can make the distance between these two and everything moves too closer together and we save two columns. So this is not an optimal area and actually finding the optimal area is NP-hard. However, we have simply isomorphic subtrees have congruent drawings up to translation. So we have, if we have the exact same subtree twice, then it's also drawn exactly the same way. And axial isomorphic subtrees also have congruent drawings up to translation and reflection. So we have this subtree here and the same mirrored here and up to this mirroring they also have exactly the same drawing. This is the type of symmetry that we want. So these are the properties that we wanted and that we got. Almost, this is not optimal, but it's close to it. Actually, you can already see here that if we make the area smaller we might lose these two properties. But that's two optimization criteria that probably cannot be achieved together. Now this is only for binary trees, but this whole algorithm can be extended to work also with rooted trees. How do we do that? So if we have a vertex with more than two children, then we still use the same approach. We divide it into all these four subtrees, we draw each of them recursively, and then we try to merge them together. So we get drawings of these, we have all these displacements, and we have the left and the right contours for each of them. Now we go from left to right. We take the first two, we look at their contours, and we try to find a displacement so that the minimum distance here is 2. And that gives us then the distance from this to this vertex. We get the contour of this whole thing. We look at the next one, again we try to find the displacement such that the minimum distance is 2, which gives us the displacement between these two. Then we compare the contours of these two, we find the displacement and we're done. So this gives us a drawing with almost all these properties. There's one problem here. Because we go from left to the right, it might happen that we have a very symmetric subtree that's not drawn symmetrically at all, like this one here. We have to compare the first two, get the displacement, the next two, get the displacement, but then the distance is between these two here. So the displacement from here to here has to be huge. And now even though these two here could be axially isomorphic, these two here could be axially isomorphic, and now we have the problem. Since these two small subtrees here are skewed to the left, if we have the same subtree here, but axially isomorphic somewhere else, it would not have a congruent drawing up to translation and reflection, because there these two subtrees would go to the other side, basically. So we lose this symmetry here. We only have this one left. It's still fine, it's still a very good drawing, we still have very nice properties, it's not optimal. However, there are some algorithms that do some post-processing, where you try to afterwards equally space out the children around the root, and there we can get back this property, but that's not something that we want to do in this lecture. In the next part, we want to have a look at so-called HV drawings of trees.